Most essential nutrients are recycled within the ecosystem. Among all this, nitrogen is an important element that plays a great role in the growth of plants. The availability of nitrogen and other nutrients in the soil solution will limit the rate of uptake of plants and consequently the rate of net primary productivity, which is the rate of energy storage as organic matter after respiration. Nitrogen is one of the most important constituents of all living organisms from bacteria to men. Animals obtain required amounts of nitrogen by eating plants and other animals. However, plants obtain nitrogen from either the soil or the air. Air has large amounts of nitrogen in its elemental form, but plants cannot use nitrogen in its elemental form. So nitrogen should be converted to nitrogen-containing compounds such as ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates in order to be used by the plants. Some blue-green algae present in the bacteria can fix the atmospheric nitrogen into their protoplasm. These organisms convert the atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. After converting this into other organic substances, plants utilize them for growth. When animals eat these plants, these substances enter into the animal body. When these animals or plants are decomposed by the bacteria, nitrogen is released back into the atmosphere. As plant tissues senesce, the nutrients are returned back to the soil surface in the form of dead organic matter. However, before senescence occurs, plants absorb some of the nutrients from these senescing tissues into the perennial parts of the plant. This process is called retranslocation. Once at the forest floor, various decomposers break down and consume the dead plant tissues. The cycle is now complete and nutrients are again available to the plants. Decomposition is a key process in nutrient cycling. It is the breakdown of chemical bonds formed during the construction of plant and animal tissues. This process consists of a variety of decomposer organisms that feed on dead organic matter or detritus. Organisms most commonly associated with the decomposition are the microflora composed of bacteria and fungi. Bacteria are the dominant decomposers of dead animal matter, while fungi are the major decomposers of plant material. Bacteria may be aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic bacteria require oxygen for metabolism, while anaerobic bacteria do not. This type of respiration is called fermentation. Decomposition is aided by fragmentation of leaves, twigs, and other dead organic matter by invertebrate detrivores. These organisms fall into four major groups classified by body width. First is the microfauna and microflora that includes protozoans and nematodes that inhabit the water in soil spores. Next is the mesofauna, which includes mites and potworms that live in soil-air spaces. Next is the macrofauna, followed by megafauna, represented by snails, millipedes, hillbugs, and the earthworms. The true masters of the soil are the earthworms. Their main role is to filter the soil and to create a rich and fertile soil composition. Most of them feed on undecayed leaves and other plant matter. They have major influences on soil structure. The soil excretions that earthworms produce are more nutrient-rich than the surrounding topsoil. The other keepers of the soil are the gastropods. Snails and slugs slowly creep along their course, feeding on dead foliage with their teeth that wear down after great use. Energy and nutrients incorporated into bacterial and fungal biomass do not go unexploited in the decomposer world. Feeding on bacteria and fungi are the microbivores that includes amoebas, springtails, and mice.
mites. The ecology studied the decomposition process by designing experiments following the decay of dead animal and plant tissues through time. The first and widely used approach is the use of litter bags in examining the decomposition of dead plant tissues. Litter bags are mesh bags constructed of synthetic material that does not quickly decompose. The holes must be big enough to allow the decomposers to enter and feed on the fixed amount of litter inside, but small enough to prevent decomposing plant material from falling out of the bag. The downside of this approach is that the mass of organic matter that remains in the litter bag includes both the original plant material and the decomposers that have colonized and grown on the plant litter. A similar approach is used to evaluate plant decomposition of plant litter in stream ecosystems. Leaf litter provides large inputs of energy and nutrients into the streams. This often accumulates in areas of active decomposition, forming leaf packs. Plant litter is placed in mesh bags which are anchored in areas of active decomposition. As with terrestrial litter bags, leaf packs are placed in the streams for a few weeks to measure the weight loss and chemical changes of the leaves during the decomposition process. In contrast with the terrestrial litter bag experiment, leaf pack studies often quantify the diversity of micro and macro decomposers. When leaves fall to the ground, they soak up water and soluble compounds are released. Along comes an insect or a worm to start breaking them into smaller pieces. Now that they are in various small pieces, the microorganisms can begin their work. The most common microorganisms to do this are bacteria and fungi. They secrete chemicals which further breaks down the leaves. The partially digested plant material that is left is called humus. Humus is a major source of nutrition for plants. The rate of decomposition is influenced by the availability of oxygen, moisture, access by decomposers, the material being broken down, and the temperature. Warmer is faster. Decomposition can be accelerated in a compost pile by the buildup of heat and moisture and the turning to increase oxygen availability. Carbon is plentiful in plant remains and serves as an energy source for microbes that decompose them. Carbon compounds present in plant litter includes glucose, cellulose, and lignin. Glucose molecules are physically small. Their chemical bonds can be broken easily, making them high-quality sources of energy for microbes. Cellulose, the main constituent of cell walls, are more complex in structure, making them a moderate-quality source of energy. The much larger lignin molecules are the most complex and variable. These are intricately folded in three-dimensional structures, effectively shielding much of the internal structure from enzyme activity. This is a low-quality source of energy. Bacteria have no problem decomposing glucose, cellulose, and other similar compounds. The composition of lignin, however, due to their complex structure, relies on basidiomycetes, commonly known as mushrooms. The major nutrient that these microbes put into the soil is nitrogen. Plants are unable to receive nitrogen from the air. So how do microbes deliver this key nutrient to plants? Let's consider a simple example. Application of fertilizers containing mineral nitrogen as ammonium and nitrate. Organic fertilizers contain mostly complex forms of nitrogen and ammonium. Uptake of nitrate is rapid due to the high particle mobility. Most plants therefore prefer nitrate over ammonium. Uptake of ammonium is lower than that of nitrate. Ammonium is bound to clay particles in the soil and roots have to reach it. Most of the ammonium is therefore nitrified before it is taken up by plants. Nitrification by soil bacteria converts ammonium into nitrate in between a few days and a few weeks. Nitrous oxide and nitric oxide are lost to the atmosphere during the process. The nitrification is favored by lack of oxygen. Soil bacteria convert nitrate and nitrite into gaseous nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, and nitrogen. These are lost to the atmosphere.
Immobilization transforms mineral nitrogen into soil organic matter. Activity of soil microbes is mainly stimulated by ammonium. Immobilized nitrogen is not immediately available for plant uptake, but needs to be mineralized first. Mineralization of soil organic matter and manure releases ammonium into the soil. Ammonia volatilization occurs when ammonium is converted to ammonia and lost to the atmosphere. A high soil pH level and temperature favor conversion of ammonium to ammonia. If conversion takes place at the soil surface, losses are highest. Leaching of nitrate occurs mainly during winter and follow periods when percolating rainfall washes residual and mineralized nitrates below the root zone. Accurate fertilization increases nitrogen use efficiency and reduces the risk of leaching during the growth period and afterwards. As decomposition progresses, the rate of mass loss decreases. Percent nitrogen decreases due to immobilization, resulting to a decrease in the carbon-nitrogen ratio. And as glucose and cellulose are degraded first, the remaining organic matter sees an increasing concentration of lignin. Rhizosphere is a region of the soil where plant roots function. It is an active zone of root growth and death characterized by intense microbial and fungal activity. Decomposition is more rapid in the rhizosphere than in bulk soil. Roots alter the chemistry of the rhizosphere by secreting carbohydrates into the soil, which accounts 40% of dry matter production of plants. This large expenditure of carbon must be of importance for plants to justify the significant trade-off in carbon allocation. Some estimates conclude that at the global scale, Rhizosphere processes utilize approximately 50% of the energy fixed by photosynthesis in terrestrial ecosystems, contribute roughly 50% of the total carbon dioxide emitted from terrestrial ecosystems, and mediate virtually all aspects of nutrient cycling. Hi Al, I wanted to talk to you about how soil is made. Now we spoke before about how rocks erode to kind of create soil. And what you get is kind of a sand kind of thing like this. But that's not what we really uh, think about as soil. Uh, what's missing there is something else. Take a look at this. Now this is nice, good black dirt. The difference is besides the little pieces of rock and sand that's there, there's also organic matter. Organic matter is anything living or that came from something living. So for example, a leaf. Now this is a dead leaf that's fallen. Eventually this gets broken down and becomes a part of, mixes with the sand and becomes part of this darker soil. So as it gets broken down, it might start to look like this, and then the pieces get so small you can't even tell they're there anymore. So how does a leaf go from something like this to that? Well, it needs some help. One of the things that does it is bacteria. Bacteria eats away at the, uh, the organic matter and breaks it down into very, very small pieces. But even before bacteria get started, there's organisms called detritivores. Now we'll talk later about why they're called that. But here's some examples. Here's a detritivore. What he does is he's got a really tiny mouth, and at night he comes up and eats at the leaf and any other dead grass, things like that. And eventually it looks like this. But, you know, whatever goes in this end has to come out this end. And that, those small particles, become a part of the soil or get broken down by bacteria and become a part of the soil. Another example of a detritivore is something like this. Now this is a giant cockroach, not something that you normally see around here, but he's an example of the types of beetles and bugs and millipedes that eat dead organic matter, cause it to break down, and then become a part of soil. 
The composition in aquatic ecosystems follow a similar pattern to that in terrestrial ecosystems, but with some major differences influenced in watery environment. The composition in terrestrial environment involves leaching, fragmentation, colonization of detrital particles by bacteria and fungi, and consumption of detrivores and microbivores. However, in aquatic environments, plant litters decompose more rapidly than those on the marsh surface because they are more accessible to detrivores and the stable physical environment is more favorable to microbial decomposers than are the alternative periods of wetting and drying that characterize tidal environments. In flowing water ecosystems, aquatic fungi colonize leaves, twigs, and other particulate matter. Meanwhile, in the still open water of ponds, lakes, and the ocean, dead organisms and other organic material called particulate organic matter drift toward the bottom. Particulate organic matter is constantly processed until organic matter settles on the bottom to form humic compounds. Aerobic and anaerobic decomposition in the benthic environment form only a part of the decomposition process. Dissolved organic matter in the water column also provides a source of fixed carbon for decomposition. Major sources of dissolved organic matter are free-floating macroalgae, phytoplankton, and zooplankton inhabiting the open water. An important component of the aquatic nutrient cycle is the microbial loop. Here is a short description of microbial loop. The microbial loop in the ocean is the all the microbial organisms and their relationships to each other in terms of their interactions in the food web. The microbial loop forms the very bottom of the food web with all the microscopic organisms. So we have um, the bacteria taking up uh, organic material from the water and growing. We have the algae using sunlight to photosynthesize and grow and then we have the microzooplankton that then eat the bacteria and the algae. And those microzooplankton then release in their feces nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that are really important for the growth of the bacteria and the algae and they recycle that back into the system. We've got to remember also that once we get out of that microbial loop then those small microzooplankton are eaten by larger zooplankton and that then goes up through the food web to the larger organisms to fish and marine mammals in the southern ocean. Also you get the cycling of carbon in the water so you get um, release of um, organic carbon by the algae and also the microzooplankton and that's taken up by the bacteria so you get quite a quick cycling of both nutrients and carbon within the microbial loop and that's really important in terms of um, how fast things are moving and cycling within the ocean and also when you have a dominance of the microbial loop in the ocean you tend to get a lot of recycling in the upper waters and then you don't get as much carbon, the, the big algae and the larger zooplankton growing with lots of carbon sinking out into the deep ocean, what we call carbon sequestration, where you take carbon out of the atmosphere into the water, it's used by the algae and then taken into the deep ocean. Primary productivity determines the rate of nutrient transfer from inorganic to organic form and decomposition determines the rate of transformation of organic nutrients to inorganic form. Therefore, the rates at which these two processes occur directly influence the rates at which nutrients cycle through the ecosystem. But how do these two key processes interact to limit the rate of internal cycling of nutrients through the ecosystem? The answer lies in their interdependence. Both the quantity and quality of organic matter as a food source for decomposers directly influence the rates of decomposition and nitrogen mineralization. Lower nutrient concentrations in the dead organic matter promote immobilization of nutrients from the soil and water. Nutrient demands of decomposer populations are met which effectively reduces the nutrient availability to the plants. This adversely affects primary productivity. 
Nutrient cycling is an important process in all ecosystems since it represents a cyclic link between net primary productivity and decomposition. Nutrient cycling varies between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. There is a vertical separation between zones of production, which is photosynthesis, and decomposition in all ecosystems. In terrestrial ecosystems, plants always act as a bridge between the decomposition zone at the soil surface and the productivity zone in the canopy. Through decomposition, nutrients are made available in the soil which may then be accessed by the plant through its root system. The plant's vascular system transports nutrients coming from the roots to the sites of production located in the canopy. However, in aquatic ecosystems, plants do not always act as a bridge. In shallow water ecosystems, emergent vegetation acts as a bridge since the plant roots are fixed in the sediments. But as water depths increase, the composition in the benthic zone is physically separated from surface waters where temperatures and light availability support productivity. The vertical structure of the physical environment in open water ecosystems should be examined to understand how nutrients are transported. Dead organic matter from adjacent terrestrial ecosystems brings nutrients to streams. The continuous and directional movement of water affects nutrient cycling in stream ecosystems. Nutrient spiraling, which was first coined by Jack Webster from the University of Georgia, is described as the process where nutrients are continuously being transported in a spiral rather than a cycle. Flowing water involves a spatial element where nutrients are constantly carried downstream. Water movement and speed determines how quickly the nutrients are carried and the physical and biological factors that hold the nutrients in place. Spiraling is measured as the distance required to complete one cycle. The longer the required distance, the more open spiral. Coastal ecosystems are among the most productive environments. An estuary is described as a place where salt water joins fresh water. A semi-enclosed part of the coastal ocean where salt water is diluted and is partially mixed with water coming from the land. As the river and ocean meet, current velocity decreases and sediments are deposited within a short distance called the sediment trap. Tidal subsidy is a process where the rise and fall of water depth with the tidal cycle flushes out salts and toxins from marshes and brings in nutrients from coastal waters. Detritus and salt marshes is broken down majorly by bacteria and fungi. The low oxygen content of sediments favors anaerobic bacteria. The tidal cycle replaces oxygen-depleted waters within sediments with oxygenated water. The pycnocline, which functions similarly to the thermocline, is the zone of maximum vertical difference in density. Living and dead particles settle through the pycnocline into the countercurrent, which is then carried to the estuary with their nutrient content. The global pattern of ocean surface currents influences patterns of surface water temperatures, productivity, and nutrient cycling. The Coriolis effect drives the patterns of surface currents. Movements of surface waters results in deeper, more nutrient-rich waters transported vertically. If someone just walked up to the soil and said, oh, that's just, you know, some dirt, it'd be like going and looking at the ocean and saying, oh, look at that big bucket of water. Soil is a super organism. Uh, meaning that uh, it's alive, uh, it's teeming with life, teeming with diversity, um, much similar to our own bodies. You know, I mean, your, your own body, 70% of the cells in your body are actually bacteria. So, you know, theoretically, we're more bacteria than what we are even human. World Watch ca calls soil the quiet crisis of the 21st century. So we are, um, unbeknownst to the vast majority of people, seriously eroding, not only losing soil to, um, to erosion, that's the most visible thing, but we're actually t losing organic matter. We're killing organic matter in the soil. And for people who don't know, again, you have to just think about it. If you Just imagine that you're a microorganism or an earthworm living in the soil, and someone dumps millions of pounds of fer either fertilizer, which you 
intuitively might not seem like a bad thing, meaning it's several chemicals, dumps you know, intense concentrations of these three chemicals on you, and then pours herbicides and pesticides on, which are biocides. They're designed to kill things. Anybody hear that and think we're going to end up with more organic matter in the soil? So we're, we're killing organic matter in the soil and we're losing it due to mechanical loss of soil erosion. And um, most of the consensus reports are that we're losing about a half a percent a year globally. globally. So it's, this is not an insignificant thing. As soon as we start killing the organisms with these inorganic fertilizers, with these salts, with these toxic chemicals, you just go downhill faster. You destroy more and more of the biology, more and more quickly, until you're really in a system that you have no choice but to use those inorganic fertilizers. You have to, and you start to see effects on water quality because all of those inorganic fertilizers are highly leachable. Oh, we start seeing rivers and lakes and streams having horrible problems, and we have no good water to drink or it starts costing an incredible amount of money to buy the drinking water that tastes okay. So it's having far-reaching consequences. In our whole society, human health is definitely very much involved. Well, animal health is involved. If the plants that you're eating don't contain the nutrients to keep your animals healthy, to keep you healthy, our health is suffering. So can we reverse all of this process? How do you make those organisms and get them back into the soil. And it's fairly simple. We go back to what was described in the Roman Empire, and we make really good compost. So that's why the life in the soil is so important and why mulch is so key, because mulch isn't just holding in you know, the moisture. It's also uh, sequestering carbon and, and converting um, helping plants convert CO2 into humus and, um, and also creating these conditions for all kinds of teeming communities of microorganisms that maintain that stability. It's key and once you learn this stuff you never want to spray a chemical on the land again. I love that expression, the universe beneath our feet and it just brings to mind looking up into the night sky and seeing countless stars and that there's there's a whole world out there that's just unimaginably big. So too are the microbes in the soil food web. Beneath our feet, everywhere we walk on soil, in every teaspoon, are billions of interacting and interrelating microbes. And they are the source and the creation of fertility in soil. They are what allow plants to grow. So clearly, if there was no soil food web, in my mind, we would not have plants. If we had no plants, that wouldn't just knock out the vegetarians in the world, it would knock out all of us, including the cows and the pigs and the goats and the chickens too. Um, every person has to realize that the way they're living is either taking something out or taking less out or actually putting something back. So whether it be, um, you know, let's say promoting soil fertility by eating organic food or just doing a little composting yourself at home or growing a little something, all these little things, I think it does relate to each person, you know, and, and ultimately, um, if you go all the way to climate change and the issue of carbon sequestration in the soil, which I think um, is an amazing next chapter in people's awareness of the soil, you can see that anything you do that increases soil fertility is actually a small piece of reversing climate change. And I think there is general um, hope that um, if enough of the world move, moves in an organic direction and we begin adding more organic matter to the soil, it actually could make a measurable difference in the trajectory of climate change, which is a big thing to say, but it's also a really beautiful prospect. There are many, many, many opportunities to engage. Um, and anywhere there's a piece of ground, anywhere there's a piece of ground, you have the potential to engage in this process. So, go for it. <laughs>